This is the Thought Leaders Podcast. Episode, I got to sit down with YouTube cooking sensation Adam Agusia. It was an awesome conversation, and before we get started, I just want to give you some highlights in case you want to skip ahead. At about the 13-minute mark, we really got into talking about what it's like um, to cook at home and why Adam is all about inspiring regular average people to be the best at-home cooks they can be. Then at around the 30-minute mark, we really got to understand the entire advertising side and why it's so important for him to incorporate that into his videos. And finally, if you want to skip to the end, starting about the 53-minute mark, we had a great conversation about how Adam has an awesome relationship with his fans and how he likes to keep them happy, but also how they help him and he makes great videos. All right, everyone, enjoy the episode. First of all, Awesome to meet you. Uh, let me just fanboy out for a second. Oh, goodness. And, uh, <laughs> say thank you very much. You have definitely helped me cook so many dishes uh, throughout, I guess, over the last two years. I want to say the first time I saw you was, I think, uh, one of the pizza videos, but definitely love the white wine video. Definitely been adding that into everything I do cooking-wise. Um, and I'm super excited that you're here today. So... Yeah, I really just wanted to get a sense of who you are and yeah, just take it away. Okay, where do you want me to start? So yeah, let's start with how, if I'm wrong, you were a university professor, right? Yes. Are you yeah, still so, doing that? No, uh, I was on the journalism faculty at Mercer University here in Macon, Georgia. And because I had come from a primarily radio and podcasting background and a, and a print background, um, I, my video skills were lacking. Um, they were okay. I mean, I could do, I could do a 90 second, you know, TV news package, but <laughs> anybody can do that. <laughs> um, and I just needed to get better, um, so that I could teach better because, uh, our program there is, you know, very interdisciplinary, very cross platform. Um, and I had frankly, a few students who were just smoking me in terms of video skills and I just <laughs> needed to up my game. Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I found some various ways of working on it, but eventually I was just like, I need to give myself, I need to do something more advanced and I need to give myself a homework assignment that I'll actually do. And, you know, because I'm so interested in cooking, I'd always wanted to try to make a cooking video. So I just took some gear home from school one day and made two cooking videos that are still on my channel. Um, they're from maybe two years ago. Um, and uh, you know, and I, I learned from the experience. I, I not throw them up on YouTube with the expectation that anything would happen. It was just a place to host the videos, right? So I could show my friends and family. Um, mm -hmm. I did that, um, and nothing came of it. And then I had this pizza recipe that I've been working on for a long time, um, that I had been getting particularly obsessive about. And, you know, my friends were saying, hey, you know, when are you going to share us this pizza recipe you've been working on? And I was just like, ah, it's so hard to describe. I feel like I should just show you. So I was like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a video about that. So that was Christmas break 2018. So the very end of 2018, uh, I took some gear home from school and made my first pizza video. Um, and that one kind of looked a little bit better. I had, had figured out lighting a little bit better at that point. And, uh, again, you know, just threw that up on YouTube without any expectation that something would happen with it just to show my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, that said, you know, because I do what I do for a living, you know, I, I know how to write a good headline. I know how to do, you know, search engine optimization. I know how to, I know how to make a piece of content findable, you know, and I don't think that I did that with that particular video with any expectation that it would be found, but purely out of force of habit of observing best practices, right? Um, which I did. And then, you know, I suppose in retrospect, not surprisingly, because it's a thing that people are very interested in, people just organically started to find that pizza video. Um, and it was in, it was almost exactly a year ago, March uh, of 19, when I just, I was, what I was getting was a lot of the um, YouTube, someone has subscribed to your channel emails, right? Okay. <laughs> um, and I was starting to just get a bunch of these and I was like, what the hell is this, you know? And so I kind of looked at it and I said to my wife, I was like, hey, someone, you know, something's going on with my, that old pizza video. Like, you know, like a hundred thousand people have watched it. Um, 
and she was like, wow, you know, you should like apply to, to monetize or whatever. And so I, I kind of looked into that because I knew you had to kind of hit a certain basic benchmark of viewership before you can um, apply to monetize for, for anyone watching or listening who doesn't know what that means is that um, a human being in California has to like look at your channel, make sure that it's kosher, and then they will start selling ads against it. That is to say, not ads that appear in the video, but the kind of the pre-rolls and post-rolls, the, the the produced ads that YouTube plays before you get the video that you're trying to watch, right? You have to, your channel has to be approved for monetization before they will do that. And when they do that, you get a cut of the money. Um, and it's a very lengthy process to get approved, as you can imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a human yeah. process. And so it usually takes about a month to get approved for monetization. So I put in my application because it's, I mean, it's fine. I mean, people, there's, you know, small YouTubers who spend years trying to kind of meet those minimum viewership benchmarks before they can apply for monetization. And I just looked and I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm already there. Um, so I applied and then the video continued to kind of go viral. And I was watching all these views, all of these unmonetized views, <laughs> you know, okay. yeah. go up. And I was thinking, damn, this is my one chance, you know? Yeah. And, uh, um, and eventually, you know, it, it came back and they approved it. And, uh, I, I you know, I, it's, I, I feel very kind of thankful that all this happened to me when I'm like 37 and not 27 or God forbid 17, um, <laughs> because, you know, I've been around making content for a long time and, you know, I've had individual pieces go viral in, in pretty big ways before. So, you know, I, it's not my first trip around the sun and I like, I, I, I know that when you get an audience of that size, it doesn't matter if like this is the kind of content that you set out to make or this is where you intended to take your career. You know, it doesn't, you know, you don't choose it. It chooses you. <laughs> and you just kind of yeah. grab on and hold on to it as long as you can. So <clears throat> I went ahead and made a few more videos. I think the next one I did was this chocolate chip cookie recipe that um, I'd done. It was kind of novel. It sort of involves starting them under the broiler and then switching over to the oven to get this kind of particular cosmetic look on the top. Um, and I, 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 you know, I thought it would do well. And indeed, um, that one, you know, it's traceable to a specific thing. Some someone posted it on Reddit r slash videos, and that it, that went viral there. And I had this huge, like, single day, you know, seven hundred fifty thousand views spike, something like that, um, from that post, um, which was great. And I so I got a lot of subs that way, and uh, you know, and I just kept making stuff. And um, it, there was a moment, maybe a month or two into this, when like my numbers really started to dip again, mm -hmm. um, and I thought, ah, maybe this was a fluke. Maybe this isn't going to be a thing. But then, you know, for some reason, it just sort of picked up again, and you know, no, no, no growth goes in a straight line. Um, and it was sort of toward the end of last academic year. I, I was like, ah, I think I'm going to need to quit my job. But I wasn't totally sure, and so I went ahead and signed my contract for the for for this academic year. Um, but then, like two weeks after I signed it, I was like, "Damn, I need to quit my job because <laughs> I couldn't possibly do both things at the same time," you know. And and this was just starting to make so much money, you know. Um, so luckily, Mercer was great, and you know, I came back. I worked the fall semester, uh, and then they released me mid year. Um, which was terrific. Um, that said, fall semester was absolute torture, <laughs> trying yeah. to trying to kind of nurture this new career and also not totally ignore my students. Um, and I also I have little kids, and so it's you know it was, it was a real it was a really hard time. I was very underslept. It was really hard on me, like physically. Um, but came out of it, and here we are. Uh, and I am a full time YouTuber, which is real weird. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know I'm in a moment now where um, you know, and, and no, no, I mean, like I said, you know, no growth is linear. Um, mm -hmm. I've had total like dips and spikes and dips and spikes, but the overall growth curve has been upward and quite steep. Um, but now, you know, you and I are speaking in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and, uh, yeah, the, the ad marketplace is already, uh, dipping quite a bit. Um, but luckily, you know, I, again, because this happened to me when I'm 37 and not 27 or 17, I knew that I needed to make as much money with it as, as I could while I could. And so, um, I, I got, I, I hooked up with a really excellent agent, Colin West at Solaro management, um, who, 
sold in video sponsorships, which, you know, annoyed a lot of my viewers, but I was like, you know, <laughs> ads pay for content so that you don't have to. Um, and yeah, I, you know, with those sponsorships and everything that Colin brought in and continues to bring in, um, I was making, you know, really more money than I needed, considerably more money than I needed, but I knew because I'm old and I lived through, you know, the housing crash of 2008 and all that kind of stuff. I knew this wasn't going to last forever. And so I needed to save while I could, while times were good. And so here I am <laughs> and, you know, I'm in a position now where like I could make no money at all for two, three years and be fine, you know? Um, and so while other people's favorite YouTubers are probably going to have to quit and go try to find real jobs right now, I'm going to be right here <laughs> making videos for you, uh, and, uh, maintaining yeah, my yeah, audience. Yeah. So that when the uh, so that when the brands come back and want to try to start making money again, I'll be right there with a big fat audience for them to for them to chew on, you know. Yeah, I mean that makes a makes a lot of sense, and it's really awesome to hear that you're going to be able to continue to videos even during this crazy time. But I just wanted to go back to something you touched on at the beginning, where you said it kind of uh, you know the content chooses you and less you choosing the content. So you know you are in my opinion one of you know one of the leaders of this cooking revolution on youtube is that something that you know you really embrace or it's something that it's just kind of go you know you go with the flow oh no i'm thrilled with it i mean yeah. it's it's not like if i if someone had said you know if you're you're gonna you know you're gonna break in some kind of content area, it's gonna define you. It's gonna be the thing they write in the first line of your obituary. Which at this point, this probably is going to be <laughs> the thing they write in the first line of my obituary, right? Like, would you choose to be like you know an internet cook? And that's probably not the thing I would have chosen a year ago. But okay. like, it's up there in like the top five, so it's awesome. Yeah. You know, I'm thrilled, and and it's you know I I I think that if I was only doing recipe content. I, I would get bored real quick, mm -hmm. um, which is why, you know, really a month into doing this regularly, I branched out to doing my Monday videos, which are kind of videos about food, but not recipes. Um, I was actually you know, about to ask you about that and how yeah. you transitioned into that, which, cause I think it's really cool. Yeah, because that's, I mean, honestly, like those videos are much more suited to my skill set. I mean, they're based, they're journalism, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and they got they got a lot fewer views initially, and now they're you know almost equal with the recipe videos in terms of views. Um, and you know I had a lot of people, a lot of viewers resisting them initially. Um, they were like, "I didn't come here for this science crap or whatever," <laughs> you know. Uh, but you know, um, I, I pushed through, and and now those videos have found their audience too, which is great. And and with those videos, I am much more interested. Like I I could totally do this for the rest of my working life. And and you know, there, there's so many uh, avenues of curiosity that you can follow. You know, doing journalism about food and immediately adjacent topics, right? Mm -hmm. You know that that can easily fill a lifetime. Whereas, like I think for me, not being a chef. You know, I probably couldn't fill a lifetime with just recipes. You know, that's that's for that's for Jacques Pepin. It's not for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're we're super ahead of the curve, by the way, on that because about the food science uh, angle. Mm -hmm. Because I think I haven't watched a burger video on YouTube across any channel without the words Maillard reaction" being mentioned in the yeah. last six to eight months, and you were like way ahead of that stuff. So I think it's really cool how you have that really nice balance. Mm. between the food and uh this. but i'd love to know how you kind of get inspiration from actually from both the types of videos or if they just come to you naturally yeah um so for the monday videos it's very easy i have so many things i've always wondered about in terms of like you know the the cook you know gordon ramsay says you need to do this and it's like is that really true does the, <laughs> okay. does, the does the you know does the research literature really bear that out because it's it's so funny i mean you know it's, the, the highest levels of professional chefdom where people are doing truly extraordinary work and they deserve all the credit for that in the world, you know, brilliant stuff. Nonetheless, their field is filled with all kinds of spurious, empirically false nonsense, right? Yeah. And I don't think that that's their fault, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just a product of what their working environment is like, you know, you have to, 
you have to make decisions about what to do and go with it in a in a in a workplace like that. And you can't always make evidence based decisions. Um, you don't have time for that. Right? Or maybe you do make evidence based decisions, but they um, they're ones that are also kind of balanced against reality. So I'll give you a classic, a really good example. I think is um, in that first New York style pizza video that I did. I bloomed my yeast in warm sugar water, totally traditional. And then when I started building up the dough, I put my salt straight into the yeast water before mm -hmm. I put in the flour. This is not how people are taught to do it in culinary school. They're taught to put dry ingredients on, in first and then put the salt on top of the dry ingredients because the salt could conceivably kill the yeast, right? And mm -hmm. that's true, of course. You know, salt kills microorganisms. It's, it'll, it'll kill macroorganisms. <laughs> put, package you in enough salt, you'll die. <laughs> it's you, true. You know? um, but um, it... Uh, it, uh, but anyways, you know, what I, what I know <laughs> from experience is just that like, I can totally put the salt straight in there and the dough will still rise really vigorously. It's not killing the yeast. Um, you know, you'd have to, you, you need some minimum amount, you know, the extent to which salt is going to kill your yeast is going to be a function of both the concentration of the solution and the time in which the salt is in the solution, right? And mm -hmm. I don't know which of those is insufficient to kill the yeast, but one of them is, or maybe both, you know, the yeast just don't die, right? Yeah. And so I got all these like professional cooks just saying, oh my God, you're just such an idiot and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, well, here's what's going on is that your chef boss needs to give you a rule, right, to follow that is going to anticipate any number of scenarios, right? Your boss doesn't know how long that yeast water is going to be sitting around before you get around to putting in the flour, right? You might yeah. put in the oil and the, sh and the salt and everything, and then you have to go and deal with something else for an hour and then come back. And at which point maybe the yeast will be dead, right? So mm -hmm. your boss doesn't know. So that's why your boss gives you a rule that is designed to keep you out of trouble in a range of scenarios. Okay. And that's fine. Like that's, that's great. I mean, policies, that's what policy making is all about, whether in, in business or in government or whatever, you know, um, nonetheless policies, uh, you know, they, 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 they work, they're good for a world where the only measure is what works in practice. Okay. Not necessarily what is true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I understand why a lot of what they do is kind of divorced, not not quite aligned with empirical reality, right? Um, but nonetheless, that's true, right? And so as a result, a lot of what professional chefs say is not really applicable to home cooks. And my goal, my raison d'etre, like <laughs> at this point, is to reclaim cooking for us normals, right? Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that cooking has professionalized. I think people who do cooking at a high level deserve to be recognized as professionals and paid as such um, and given you know, a higher social status um, in our world. I think that's great. On the other hand, I really dislike that now those people are the ones teaching us cooking on TV and on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I like, you know, so probably one of my direct competitors, although I think it's stupid to think of it like that, is a young fellow named Joshua Weissman, who does amazing content, yeah. um, you know, does great stuff. But that guy's a real chef mm -hmm. and he's doing stuff that is, you know, really I don't. I think not suited to the home, unless you know your your goal as a home cook is is not just to make a decent dinner and get on with your life. It's it's that you love tinkering and you just enjoy the process. Which, by the mm -hmm. way, if like that's something that you want to do, then you know, because it's fun is an unassailable reason for doing almost anything, right? So if mm -hmm. it's fun for you, that's awesome. Do it, right? But. What I think most people are looking for is a, a recipe that will tell them how to make something not immaculate, not perfect, not the best, the greatest French fry in the world, right? They just yeah. want to know how to make something good enough, right? I want to make something that's pretty good and get on with my day. Mm -hmm. And there is a shocking lack, I think, of that kind of content in, in the ecosystem right now because it's now being led so much by chefs and not by, um, you know, people just trying to cook in their kitchens. And so I'm really trying to kind of reclaim it for that. And especially to kind of speak to 
you know, who I know to be my audience, which is, you know, overwhelmingly young men, mm -hmm. um, where I think, um, I think a lot of those young men who learn how to cook from someone from some hyper masculine <laughs> guy, <laughs> like, you know, Gordon Ramsay, like they're cooking not out of an impulse to, um, make themselves or their family happy. Um, but to try to impress everyone to kind of dazzle everyone with your prowess. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I happen to think that that's, you know, I hate using a buzzword, but I think it's a little toxic, you know, I think that's not great. Um, I think that I don't like how, um, I don't like how I think that there's a lot of bad socioeconomic undercurrents to that where, um, you know, cooking was low, was a low status job in our society when it was mostly women and poor people doing it. But now all of a sudden that like, you know, rich white boys from nice families want to cook all of a sudden, Oh, it's a high status profession. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's great. Right. So like, I, I would love to try to influence the young men watching me to cook, you know, to like, you know, be a, be a big enough man about it that you can cook for the purposes of nurturing people and making them happy and not for the purposes of showing them how awesome you are. Like show them how awesome you are by doing something else. Like go out and press people with something more meaningful. Like most people, like if you try, if for no other reason, because when you try to impress people with your cooking, you're usually just gonna like fall on your face and look dumb, right? Mm -hmm. You know, don't do that on your first date. On your first date, try to make something she actually wants to eat, not, <laughs> yeah. not something that's gonna dazzle her, you know. Uh, um, my guess is my guess is that'll work better for you in the long term. Yeah, I definitely resonated with pretty much everything you just said. Um because but, I'm except a, for I, no no with everything. Uh, I was just gonna say so I um I would say one of my favorite genres on YouTube is the cooking stuff. And as I said before, I'm a huge fan of you. I'm a huge fan of Benji with Babish and Joshua Wiseman. But I will say, and this is not just because I'm talking to you, when I go to, you know, how I actually cook a recipe, I go to you and not those guys because I know that I don't have all the ingredients. I'm really not scientific, so I don't want to weigh everything out. And I think your style is awesome. So I really wanted to know, did you, did you have that style before the video started? Or is that yeah. something that kind of progressed once you started shooting? Um, no, that's, the, I'm definitely, you know, I, I'm, I was one of the boys that I am decrying, right? Like, so <laughs> like I, I learned cooking from Elton Brown in the nineties, you know, in early two thousands. Right. Um, yeah. and I was all just like, oh, it must be precise and weigh everything to the nearest gram and blah, 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 blah. Right. But you know, as I got older and real life started to happen to me, um, mm -hmm. I started to have actual responsibilities and <laughs> things to do, important things to do. And then, especially when I got kids, you know, you know, I just gradually had to unlearn all of that. And, and I, you know, I think I've said in videos before that like a lot of, you know, a lot of my personal journey in the kitchen has been about unlearning things that Alton taught me. Right. Yeah. And I don't want people to take from that, that I don't like Alton Brown. Like I, you know, that, that man is, you know, what, what he did for, for, both just just the the culinary field period but then certainly also for um for culinary content video content of all kinds is revolutionary right like the man is just a transformative figure and mm -hmm. mostly changed things for the better you know um i think that maybe in response to his influence we saw a bit of an overcorrection you know i think it's good so for example right so <laughs> To, to, our, our metaphor I used in a recent video that was controversial, but I think is really applicable is like climate change, right? Like there's lots of people who say they don't believe in climate change. And I think that maybe that's not true. I think that like, dude, like the science is there, like some, something's going on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what people are actually opposed to is what people want to do about climate change. They don't like the policies that people want to enact in response to anthropogenic climate change, which is perfectly legitimate, right? Just because you accept that 
the climate is getting warmer and humans are a significant causal factor doesn't necessarily mean that we need to do these various things in response. We can do other things in response or do nothing in response and simply try to adapt as a species, right? Mm -hmm. um, or just let the planet die, right? And, you know, <laughs> nothing lives forever. Let's have fun while we're here, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, those are all perfectly legitimate, you know, ways of dealing with that, right? So in, in, sim in a similar fashion, I think it was really good that Alton Brown taught the world who didn't know that like measuring flour by volume is inaccurate, right? That's yeah. true. Okay. You know, it's, it, it can be in all different kind of states of compression and one, one cup of flour can have 200 grams. It can have 150. It can have 250. Like there's quite a range there. Right. And that's a fact. That's an empirical fact that home cooks didn't really know, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and but it does not necessarily follow then that the response to that fact is that we should all weigh our flour to the gram like they do in a professional kitchen right right i know why they do that in professional kitchen that makes sense for the professional kitchen again because professional kitchens have lots of different people all you know working different shifts and trying to make the same exact dish for every single customer right so if mm -hmm. i'm in charge of that team i need to give them an invaluable recipe to follow to make sure that i've got quality control right it is the exact opposite of that in the home, you know, like I don't need everything to be the same every time. And in fact, I like when it's not the same every time because it allows me to kind of toy with the recipe a little bit and see if I can make it a little bit better. And, or even just for the sake of variety, I like that things come out a little bit different every time. Right. So I can learn from Alton Brown that measuring flour by volume is inaccurate, but I can deal with that fact in multiple ways. And the way that I usually deal with it in the kitchen is to um, start with some minimum baseline of flour measured by volume. You know, my basic pizza dough recipe starts with yeah. five cups of flour by volume, bread flour by volume, right? But that's a minimum. Even if it was in a really, really, you know, dense state of compression, that would still be like a minimum amount of flour. Put that in, start mixing the dough, and then just add more as you need to to keep it from being too sticky to work until it's done, right? Yeah. And <laughs> the reason that that's a better workflow for me and might be for other people, I'm not saying it has to be the right way for everybody, is that it's just like my kitchen is freaking chaos. Like I have small children running around <laughs> grabbing knives off of counters and like, <laughs> I mean, it's it's just insane. And what I like is eyes up cooking. I don't want to be down in my phone like this following a recipe to the letter. And I don't want to be down in my scale or something like that. I want to mm -hmm. have my head up. Okay. Um, and so, so I can be more present in the room so that I can be aware of who's about to stab his brother, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and also I think, just think it's more enjoyable to be cooking with your senses, your eyes and your nose and your ears and touching and things like that, as opposed to just kind of robotically painting by numbers or just assembling, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I want to, I want to carve my model car out of wood myself. I don't want to like just assemble my model car according to the instructions, right? If yeah. I want something that precise, I'll just buy it from a factory, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so yes, that's the kind of the way of cooking that I evolved over my, you know, 20, 20 years of being a grown up cooking, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where the style comes from. I certainly have tried to kind of, grow that style and expand that style to other kinds of things um as i've been doing the channel um because at this point you know i've blown through most of my old kind of standby recipes I'm, I'm really doing new recipe development for most thursdays and so i'm thinking about like how can i apply that same approach to other things right so so the recipe that i'm gonna test probably tonight or tomorrow is gonna be like i love gyros um, I mean, it's okay. one of the best, greatest sandwiches in the world, right? But yeah, like the, the gyro is is really unsuited to the home kitchen, right? Yeah. Um, as proven by like Alton Brown in his gyro episode of Good Eats, right? Like, because you need to have a, you know, you need to have a, a rotisserie, right? Mm -hmm. And and to to kind of cook the gyro loaf, which like he, you know, in his Alton Brown way, you know, MacGyver is this incredible rotisserie, which again, it's like if, if you get off on doing that kind of stuff at home, that's awesome. Do it, yeah. you know, but don't feel that you have to in order to make a good meal for yourself, right? 
So, but even then, you know, he does the rotisserie, but he does the wrong thing in that video, which is like he cooks it on the rotisserie, then he takes it off and cuts it up, which defeats the whole point. The whole point of the rotisserie is that you just slice off a little bit and then it continues to spin and then it browns. So you're always slicing off browned exterior, right? The mm -hmm. interior gets browned, right? That's yeah. the whole, and that's what makes gyros amazing for a restaurant that they can have a giant loaf on a rotisserie spinning all the time, right? And it's such an easy restaurant food, right? But mm. that's really ill suited to the home. So I was kind of thinking, well, how can you get like the flavor of a gyro without that whole thing, you know? So the recipe is going to be sloppy gyros. I'm basically going to make gyro mix that's kind of like a sloppy Joe mix, right? Oh, so wow. ground, you know, ground lamb um, in a spicy sauce using all of the same spices you would use in gyro loaf. And then put that on a pita with some tzatziki and tomatoes and onions, right? And then mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, or maybe just put on a hamburger bun, you know, and eat it yeah. like a sloppy joe, right? Mm -hmm. Same flavors, same, you know, basic experience, but different texture and much more suited to the home kitchen. So, yeah, that's how I'm trying to kind of take that approach and expand it and apply it to other things. That's really cool. Uh, definitely, I am spoiled because I'm, uh, you know, talking to you from Tel Aviv. So we have just oh tons gosh, of I didn't know that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's yeah, okay. yeah. So we have tons of shawarma. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the greatest thing to watch them shave it off. But um, I'm glad you talked about kind of your next video because I was wondering, um, kind of what is the process of you coming out with a new video from ideas to conceptualizing it to you know producing the whole thing? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so for the, you know, cause there's two, two such different kinds, right? It's, it's a different approach for each one. So for the Thursday yeah. videos, which are the recipe videos, it's essentially, yeah, it's just, you know, trying, trying to sitting around, trying to think of recipe ideas. Um, and I try to, you know, m as I'm thinking about that stuff, I try to kind of keep my, my recipe idea pipeline such that if someone goes to the channel and looks at the recent videos, they would see a nice assortment of things, right? Yeah. Um, even to the point of like color, like I don't want all of the thumbnails to be the same kind of color food. Like I think mm -hmm. that just doesn't grab you, right? So I kind of think about making things of a different color every week to get that just visual variety when people go to the channel. Um, so uh, I also try to like have a, a mixture of meaty and not meaty recipes. Um, you know, I, I, it's it's a shame that you know it, it's a fact that unless it's a bread based recipe like pizza anything meatless gets less views okay. and which is unfortunate cuz you know I, I you know, I, I, I eat meat, but I not nearly as much as my channel would indicate, right? Like I try mm. to eat meatless most of the, you know, for most meals, you know, yeah. um, which I think is a, just a healthier way to eat for our bodies and for our planet. Right. Um, so, but like, you know, I've, I've got sponsors and I need to get the video, the views that I promised them. And so I need to make compromises. Right. Um, but I, so I still try to strike a balance and if ever I have, you know, a, a, a week coming up that doesn't have a sponsor in it, that's when I'll usually put a, a meatless recipe there. So I'm thinking about that kind of stuff, thinking about having some desserts mixed in to the bunch. Um, anyways, so I'll come up with a recipe. I will test it, uh, which is, you know, usually a pretty lengthy process. It'll be like a whole weekend of making the same thing over and over and over and over again until it's right. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then, uh, and then, the shooting process for that, I, I've refined quite a bit. I've tried so many different approaches, and a lot of them have have not worked. Um, I've done multi camera shoots. I've done, um, you know, the, the old school Food Network thing where you you shoot the same recipe twice. You know, you do it from a wide angle, and then you go in and do it from a tight angle again, mm -hmm. and you mix those two takes together. I've tried that. Um, uh, lots of different things. And what I've found, you know, it tends to work best for me and my workflow is to do what they call shooting for the edit. That is to say, um, shooting to kind of give yourself, frankly, the minimum options when you sit down to edit, because I need to be able to blast through things really, really quickly. I can't be agonizing over, do I want this shot or this shot? Yeah. Um, and so when you shoot for the edit, basically you say, I'm going to get everything once. And that also forces you to take every single shot very seriously and make sure that every single shot works. So I'm usually these days do single camera. Um, I do the recipe once, one and done, blast through it. I just move the camera around a lot. 
um, mm -hmm. as I'm cooking, and it's very stressful to go through it. It's it's so much to juggle, um, but it's over quickly, you know. Um, and so I'll blast through that. I'll then sit down and scrub through the footage um, and look at what I've got. And from that, I will write my voiceover script. Um, and I'll then go in my coat closet with this microphone and record my voiceover um, <laughs> and edit that together, get those tracks tight, and then throw that into Premiere and then start editing the footage to the voiceover. Um, and you know, it's a pretty standard kind of about, you know, an hour of editing per minute of, of finished video sort of ratio. Um, so I'll edit through that. And then, you know, the, one of the worst things about being a YouTuber is, um, you know, once you finish the video, you're not done. Then you got to like, think about thumbnail and you got to yeah. think about, um, Hey buddy. Yes. Hello. Nice to see you. Hello. Can you go see your mom? Go see your mom, buddy. Come on, Leo. Let's go. Sorry. Ah, uh, about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, you got to do thumbnail. You got to do captions. I mean, I try to, you know, if only for the sake of accessibility, I always do real handwritten captions. But also, I think that you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be, uh, you want to make all of those muted auto plays worth something. Um, and uh, so I always do hand handwritten captions for all the vids. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you got to do meta tags and blah blah blah. Although my sense is that the algorithm isn't looking at tags so often anymore. It's it seems to be. Um, pulling more from the headline and description, but you know, that's, it's a it's dark magic to try to guess what the algorithm does. I'm probably full of shit. I don't know. Um, but I still try to take it seriously. And I use a, I use a, I use a Chrome extension called TubeBuddy That's very popular that will suggest, um, tags for you. And that really streamlines that process. It's the only feature of that <laughs> extension that is worth a damn. Um, but it's, it's, it's worth it. It's worth the money for sure. Um, and uh and yeah and so that's that's how that goes um and then if i have a sponsorship it's got to go to the sponsor at least uh two business days in advance um for approval um which i found to be really good and like and it's it's one of those ways that like you know people viewers who are annoyed by nvidia sponsorships like i just i just want to hit them upside the head because there's so many ways in which that benefits them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one of them is simply that it helps me make enough money to make making videos for you worthwhile, right? Like, yeah. uh, that's one thing. <laughs> the other thing, though, is like um, being on having sponsors in most videos because Colin does such great work um, put, makes my release schedule invaluable. Right. In a right. way that it wouldn't if I was just throwing stuff up there and letting YouTube monetize it. You know, I would be so more, much more lack, lackadaisical in my schedule. Right. I might just be like, ah, oh, I'm busy. I don't, you know, I'm just going to skip it. I'll do it tomorrow. Or maybe I'll just skip the video this week. Right. Mm -hmm. But because I, you know, I have contracts I signed three months ago, <laughs> you know, for vids coming up. Right. Like I, I have to do it. And that results in content coming more regularly and reliably to you, the viewer, right? Um, so that's that process. For the Monday videos, um, the process is pretty different. It starts with a question, usually, you know, does marinating actually do anything or something like that? Um, and I will then usually go to the scientific literature and look to see what's been written. You know, one of the things that I, I would love to kind of spread understanding of is that um, so many of the things that professional chefs argue about, you know, uh, how long should you brine something, um, you know, uh, all, all kinds of like, you know, just sort of, you know, empirical scientific chemistry type questions about cooking that they fight about have been answered definitively through science, right? Yeah. They just don't know it because most food science is oriented toward the um, processed food industry, right? Um, the people who have the money and pay for the research, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not oriented toward toward 
restaurant industry and certainly not toward the home cooking, you know, scene, right? But there's so much you can learn from what the processed food industry and meatpacking industry and all those guys do, right? And in fact, that's kind of like what is behind the entire mole molecular gastronomy movement. It was, you know, it was people like the, you know, the guys at El Bulli um under noticing <laughs> that there was this massive volume of scientific research for processed foods that had ideas that they could apply to actual haute cuisine right mm -hmm. um and you know i would love to just kind of spread more knowledge about that because all you got to do is go on pubmed or science direct or any of these kind of public searchable places and just search some basic keywords and there's something you know from the meatpacking industry or whatever that answers definitively the question that you have it doesn't have to be all old wives tales you know yeah. there's actual science right so i will seek out the science i will seek out scientists and interview them um and then i'll sit down to write those and the writing is is of those as much takes that's a whole day's work usually to write one of those because it's so much research and everything uh i then have to go and do some talking head for that which was really uncomfortable for me you know i'm a radio guy i i don't like thinking about my appearance and i'm not super comfortable on camera um but it was a mere practical reality that like i can't I don't have enough B-roll to cover all that script, you know? I'm just not gonna have enough, I'm never gonna have enough B-roll to cover all that script. I had to be on camera, right? So what I do now is I set up my camera, I set up my shot. Um, I thought about using a teleprompter setup um, and kind of ultimately dismissed that as a possibility for a few reasons. One, you know, even rather compact home teleprompter setups are pretty bulky and I shoot in my real kitchen, in my real house, not in a studio. And so I have to set up and tear down everything, every single shoot, right? Oh. So I'm not going to set up and tear down a prompter every single shoot. The other thing is that it's like if you see YouTubers who are talking from prompter, you can really tell, um, you know, if anything, just in their performance, right? It's something, there's something robotic about it that is not appealing in the world of YouTube where authenticity is the primary currency, right? It's not like... Yeah it's not like television where it's, it's really, that's not true, right? It's, you know, it's, you, know, you can't, you can't get away with, it can't feel like Dateline or whatever on YouTube, yeah. you know, um, kids are too smart for that. They see right through it, you know? Um, so, but, and also on a practical level, I wear glasses and you get reflections from prompters on, on glasses, you know? Okay. So the, the workflow that I eventually kind of landed on was I put my script on my phone. Mm -hmm. I look at my script, and I look at you know three lines of it, and I try to, rather than memorizing those lines, I try to kind of internalize the idea, you know, of what those three lines are saying, and then I look at the camera and try to deliver that idea to camera. And the wording often comes out different from what was on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to find that that usually gets me the best performance. And then I repeat, and I just have to go in kind of you know two, three sentence um, blocks. And, you know, because I'm not very good at it, <laughs> it takes me about two hours to kind of get through my whole script. And then I have to, and then another two hours of sitting down and editing all of that together. And then I got to go back and edit together all the B-roll and everything. And so those are, those are very labor intensive. I mean, usually it's at least 15, 16 hours of editing on one of those vids. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's the process for those. And I, one thing I do with those anytime, especially anytime I do anything remotely kind of science-y, um, I always get the videos fact checked. Um, at minimum, I get them fact checked by the experts that I interviewed in the video, right? Which, you know, in the world of journalism um, or traditional kind of traditional media journalism, that's called giving sources prior review and it's considered unethical. It's considered a no no. Um, the, the idea being that it gives the source um, too much opportunity to exert undue influence over the story, right? Yeah. And I've always thought that was a stupid rule. It certainly applies to like certain kinds of sources, right? You know, you're not going to give Donald Trump prior review on a political story, you know, that's stupid, right? Yeah. Um, but for expert sources, I think usually you should give them prior review. Yeah, they, you know? they are the experts. Um, <laughs> they are the experts, right? And you know, you don't you don't guarantee you don't g say to them, "Listen, I will make any changes you suggest." What you promise them is, "Look, I will give you every opportunity to try to convince me that I have it wrong." You know, mm. um, you know, and I say this in part from having having been 
a, an expert source who's been interviewed by media many times and having seen my words turned into word salad, you know, um, you know, kind of famously um, by a video that that Vox did about that was basically a rewrite of an old Slate article I had written about Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You and kind of why I think that's such an effective song because I come from a music background. That's what I went to school for. Um, and uh, and they interviewed me about my, you know, what I had written about that song and they really you know they did they did the voxy thing right which is that they their whole content approach is to say this is the one thing that explains all the things right. and so they kind of packaged it as here's the one secret chord that explains all christmas music right which is not a thing that i said <laughs> not even close to being a thing that i said and had they given me prior review i would have um I would have said, I would really encourage you to not do that. And I, you know, and because I come from that background, I think I could have give, given them a pretty sexy curiosity gap type headline that would have nonetheless been more accurate, yeah. but they didn't, you know, and, uh, and then I, you know, that, that video went viral for them and did very well, which I'm happy for them for that. But it was bad for me because I became the laughing stock of like academic music theory Twitter, you know, to this day, every Christmas when Vox republishes that video, my feed is full of like scholars whose work I know and admire just telling me that I'm stupid, which sucks um, yeah. because, you know, it wasn't even me. It was them, you know, <laughs> um, and they're, you know, because they're not media people, they're not savvy enough to be able to distinguish between things that I said and things that Vox said, you know, or ways yeah. that Vox edited me to say, you know, so anyway, so I give all of my sources prior review. <clears throat> And then if there's anything kind of scientifically controversial, right, you know, where there's something that is um, where my expert might be a bit out on a limb, you know, and there's other there's other viewpoints um, in the peer reviewed literature or something like that, I will seek out another expert to be a third party, you know, uh, fact checker, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, and again, having to work in advance for my sponsors is what gave me the practical ability to then also have time to get, you know, fact checks from scientists. Mm -hmm. And I don't know as a practical matter, if I didn't have that business necessity forcing me to work in advance, would I have also kind of gotten into this rhythm where I'm getting all of my videos fact checked, you know, in a way that is very uncommon in, um, today's journalism environment back in the, back in the good, good old days of magazine journalism, you know, uh, you, you really could do that kind of fact checking, but it does not happen anymore. Um, so like, again, that's like another kind of invisible way in which I think that the way I pay for this content actually really benefits the viewer in, in, in lots of ways. Okay. Wow. That, that's a really interesting take. And speaking of kind of the whole sponsorship, um, aspect to your channel, um, I'd love to hear more about how did you go to Colin? Did Colin come to you and kind of the reactions and how you just feel about having the sponsors sure. know, associated with you and in the videos? So, uh, no, Colin found me, which, you know, for people who are watching this, who are listening to this, who don't, don't know, you know, if, if you want to get an agent or something for doing this kind of work, don't worry. They, they'll, you know, once you're <laughs> big enough, once you're big enough to need one, they find you, um, you know, because all of you know, so many of these metrics that you see in your back end are actually public and are aggregated in places like Social Blade, um, mm -hmm. where people like Colin, you know, I'm sure Colin wakes up every morning and checks Social Blade <laughs> to see who's blowing up to kind of look for new clients, right? So yeah. the second you blow up, you know, people are going to find you. The trick is finding the right, is going with the right one, because a whole lot of predatory people start to pop up in your world the second you start to have content blowing up, okay? The first wave is usually um, publishers who are asking for your permission to republish your content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so sometimes that'll be, you know, Unilad or like, you know, when these other kind of internet native sort of companies, I mean, that's their entire business model. <laughs> um, it'll also be a lot of traditional media, you know, you know, the guardian came to me and said, maybe it was the daily mail. 
Mm-hmm. Some one of the one of the big British papers yeah. came to me and said, "Hey, can we republish your chocolate chip cookie video?" And I said, "Hey, you're in England, and they don't call it a broiler there; they call it a grill." So I think a lot of your viewers are going to be confused by that. And so if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And I'll redo the voiceover as grill. Uh, and they were kind of, that's when they, they didn't reply to me because I think that like that's their entire business model is about kind of like is about mass, right? So yeah. they have to, they basically send out 2000 of those emails every day. <laughs> and then, you know, so they can't, you know, they, they don't have, they can't kind of put time into any individual piece of content like that. So anyways, um, and I was inclined to kind of work with traditional publishers because I was, you know, I, I was a journalist and I was a journalism professor. And if anything, just out of professional courtesy, I wanted to kind of work with traditional news outlets, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm glad that a lot of that in- ended up not working out because that stuff is really predatory. And I think you, you, you know, you, dear listener, should not go, should not accept any of those deals, right? Like, because you won't make any money. Like what they're, what they're asking to do is to republish on their platform where they will get all of the ad revenue and with the promise of exposure to you. And I just see no evidence that that actually works (laughs) um, for you. Works for them, (laughs) does not work (laughs) for you. Um, so th- that's the first wave of kind of, you know, vultures who kind of start to start to circle around your corpse <laughs> when you go viral. Right. Then like, you'll start to get kind of, you know, agents and people who want to work with you. And a lot of those people don't know what they're doing. A lot of them are just kind of kids who just are kind of clueless. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, what I would highly encourage everybody to do is don't just, have a conversation in, in over email or, 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 um, or text or whatever, like get on the phone with the agent who is pitching themselves to you and really kind of feel them out and try to find out if, you know, just use all of your spider sense to find out if they're smart and if they know what they're talking about, you know? Um, and I had several conversations with, you know, suitors. Um, and Colin was the first one who sounded like he knew what he was doing, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I was re- real impressed with the guy, and I feel so so lucky, you know, that I that I ended up with him because he's just been so great, and he's made such smart decisions. And he was someone who didn't want to just take every single deal that we were offered. He was someone who was thinking long term about the growth of the channel. Who was like, you know, yeah, we could take, um, you know, we could take a big of money, way more than our usual from this company but I don't think that's good for your brand long-term. So let's, let's pass on it was his advice, you know, a lot of the time. And I think he made, you know, all the right choices. Yeah. That's really interesting and refreshing to hear. Cause I think a lot of people um, just automatically assume that YouTubers are just taking every sponsorship that is thrown mm-hmm. at them. And it's really amazing to hear that you're really vetting them and only choose kind of ones that align with what you're doing and what you believe in. Right. And I'm not sure that we've already always made the right decision. You know, I mean, it's Mm -hmm. nothing is perfect. And, you know, there's maybe a couple that I, I, if I go back and do it again, I might not have done them. Um, but you know, we're getting better at it. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, and the trick is like now with the market dipping, um, you know, is to kind of resist temptation and not, you know, go with things that are really kind of off your brand and off your mission. And again, because we made more money than we needed to when times were good, we really do have the luxury to kind of still pass on things. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, other YouTubers who maybe weren't as smart about it, um, you know, they're, they, they're going to be more desperate and they're going to take money from whoever, you know? Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, I think you might want to talk to Colin about this, but my sense from Colin is that he sometimes with some of his other clients tends to have trouble with getting them to, 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 to do more deals. Right. Whereas like I, you know, I want to do, I want to do two deals a week, you know? Um, and even though it's a lot of work, but again, it's, you know, I feel very, you know, because I'm older than the average YouTuber, you know, I, I, and I, and I lived through the last economic crash and was job searching, you know, right out of grad school, basically when the last crash happened, um, you know, you can't fool me twice. And so I'm like, no, 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 let's go, 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 go. Let's get a deal yeah. in nearly every video, you know? Right. Um, and so even though I'm, I think I'm smaller than a lot of his clients, um, 
I I do well for him because I just by out of sheer, sheer volume. I think. Yeah. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. So, kind of, I was wondering what your take is on, and you touched on a little bit before. This, I guess fan backlash on, oh, why is my favorite YouTuber um, doing this sponsorship? It's annoying. Why? Why does he have to do that? Stuff like that. Right. So, um, I think it's notable, by the way, that like that kind of backlash has really decreased for me. Right. You know, I okay. started to get that a lot initially. Um, and I get very little of that now. And I think that that is, I hope that that is in response to some things that I have done. Um, mm -hmm. So one is that I try to make every everything I put in the video fun to watch, right? Fun and interesting to watch. So you can't just like, you know, so this video is brought to you by Shadow Legends, blah, 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 right? Yeah. You know, yeah, like, everywhere. You know, don't, don't, and, and that's not a knock against Shadow Legends, by yeah, the way. Yeah. It's Shadow Legends, you know, call me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, it's just like, you know, you, you can't kind of look at the ad as being something that you do de rigueur, right? It can't be perfunctory, right? It has to be a good piece of content. And, you know, this is something that like the advertising industry figured out like nearly a century ago, you know, um, yeah. it's just that like, you know, YouTubers are having to figure it out all over again. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, every commercial you see on TV is, is, you know, pretty interesting and fun to watch, you know, because mm -hmm. yeah. they figured it out. You know, they knew a long time ago that ads have to be content. Um, and so we just need to relearn that lesson, you know, on YouTube. It's that simple. Okay. Ads have to be content. <laughs> and it, it's something that like, you know, coming from the podcasting world that I came from, you know, podcasting still hasn't figured that out. Like those, a lot of those ad reads are still so perfunctory. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? You know, there's a reason your CPMs are, are so, you know, are so pathetic and mine are insane, you know, even though we, we don't do CPM deals, we do, we do flat deals. But if you like, you could calculate a CPM retroactively. Right. Yeah. And my CPMs are freaking amazing. You know, they're great. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's because, you know, we make the ads content and I try to have something funny or fun in every single ad. Um, yeah. and I really, I really, part of that is simply the transition into the ad, which is something I've sort of become known for, that mm -hmm. like I, 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 I slip into the ad in like a really smooth way. Yeah. And it's almost to the point where like, like sometimes you could say that that's like kind of gross, that it's like, it's kind of blurring the line between ad and content. But I, you know, I do it in such a way where like, it's so smooth that it's the smoothness of it is almost an in joke with my audience. <laughs> it's always like, it's all, you know, and cause they know yeah. that that's my thing and that's what I do. And so they all, it's almost a game now where they try to like f see if they can feel it coming, <laughs> you oh, know? Okay. Like, yeah. And it's something, it's just, it's just, you know, I'm, I suck in a lot of ways. <laughs> I'm not good at all <laughs> kinds of things, but I've always been good at writing transitions. Like back when I used to, you know, produce talk shows and stuff in public radio, I, I was always the guy who on the staff who would write the ins and outs, you know, the, mm -hmm. the segment closes and the segment opens. Cause I, for some reason, my brain is just really good at kind of getting from, from point A to point Z super smoothly. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's, it's just a fun creative challenge for me, you know, so I do that. Um, <clears throat> to try to make my ads enjoyable, you know, uh, and I try to be very open and audience, honest with my audience, right? I tell them, mm -hmm. here's why I'm doing this. Okay. Um, and communicate with them and not be just, you know, uh, you know, shut up, you're stupid, you're ungrateful, you know. Um, I try to be like, here, so this is this is why I'm doing that. Here I, I tell them, you know, roughly speaking, here's how much money I'm making, you know, here's what my expenses are. Here's um, you know, yeah, this is like, you know, five times my professor's salary that I'm making right now. And the reason I'm doing that, y'all, is because this is not gonna last forever. And I remember I, some idiot replied in one of those comments saying like, you know, you don't, there's not necessarily going to be an economic crash. Like it could go up forever. It's a new world. And it's just like, dude, that's dude, not how the world works. <laughs> that's not how, that's not how any of this works. You know, yeah. um, you know, even if, 
especially considering that like in the United States, you know, our, this bull market has been debt financed, you know, public debt mm. financed, right? Like we've been completely violating the basic rules of Keynesianism. And, you know, we did massive, we went into massive public sector debt when times were bad, which we're supposed to do. Mm. And then when times are good, you're supposed to raise taxes or at least not lower them, you know, pay back the debt so that then when some kind of unanticipated externality, like an asteroid or a plague hits your, you know, economy, you're yeah. going to be ready to go back into public sector debt again. But we've just been going into debt this entire time. And the only way out of this is galloping inflation. Like that's the, you know, at the end, at the end of the day, that's the only way out of this. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyway, but anyway, so like, so I tried to like talk to my audience about that reasoning. Um, another thing that I've done is for when Colin and I have done, um, fully sponsored pieces of content, you know, vids yeah. that are all ad, right. Um, what I do is I always give my audience a heads up. I go on my community post and I say, Hey, listen, y'all, the vid that's coming tomorrow is going to be a fully sponsored vid. I, and I will make two promises to you. One, I will never put anything on the channel that I don't think is interesting and fun to watch. Right. Um, and the other promise is I will never do a fully sponsored vid in place of one of my normal pieces of content it will always be a bonus in the schedule. Right. And that has been, you know, having a week where I have to get out three videos is like really hard. You know, uh, I just had one of those weeks recently, you know, it was real, real tough. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when schools are closed and my kids are here, you know, yeah, um, you know, um, but I think putting in that extra effort has helped me to engender a lot of trust with my audience. Um, and I feel good about that. Yeah. I think it's also a possibility that going to having a, a sponsor on all, in almost every vid may have slowed the growth of my channel somewhat, you know, mm -hmm. um, like people like Joshua have, you know, his growth curve has been growth curve has been a lot steeper than mine. And that could be due to all kinds of things. I mean, he's younger and better looking <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he knows, he knows how to speak to the, to the TikTok generation in a way that I don't, okay. um, you know, uh, and, and, and so in his, in his, you know, his production values are higher. I, I suspect maybe he works with somebody like, whereas I, I, I do everything myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, but like, again, I'm trying to like, you know, it's especially if I don't hire a staff, if I don't pull a babish and hire a whole staff, you know, if I stay self-contained as a unit, I really, it's, it's still a great living. I don't need to be bigger, any bigger than this. I could be this size forever, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so I'm focused more on kind of long-term growth and long-term sustainability. And, and I've tried to, you know, the person I'm most inspired by is chef John at food wishes who, you know, has, he's the OG. He's been doing this since yeah. like, Oh eight, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that guy, you know, has not really grown his audience at all in years. You know, he's held what he has, but because he's just like, it's just him, you know, and his rebel camera, you know, cheap, cheap camera, you know, that's it. That's all he needs. You know, you don't have to grow that, that constant, you know, that, that constant impetus, that need for continual quarter to quarter growth that we see as being this kind of almost fatal flaw of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Is, is kind of part of what drives that is other people getting into the business, you know, whether it be employees or partners or shareholders, you know, just getting other people in. And when you stay relatively self-contained and owner operated, um, when it remains a closely held <laughs> business, you know, I think there's less of that impetus to constantly grow for the sake of growth. You know, I would be happy to just hold what I have for the rest of my life, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's possible, you know, I mean, on the one hand, you might be like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> how many 50 year olds are there on YouTube? Well, guess what? You know, your audience ages with you. <laughs> Everybody's getting older, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> Uh, even the, you know, the 20 year olds who are watching me, they might feel like I'm old man Ragusia, but guess what champ, you know, we're both going to have one birthday a year from here on out. And, uh, and the effective gap between us will close <laughs> as you age, right? Because the, yeah. you know, the gap between a one-year-old and a three-year-old is real big. The gap between, uh, a 51 year old and a 54 year old is very small, <laughs> um, yeah. And so your audience will grow with you and, you know, and as a result, you know, maybe that means that, you know, the real question is like, will the platform 
age, you know, in a way that, you know, I came from the public broadcasting system in the United States um, and, and NPR, that, that world, right? Mm -hmm. And NPR, unfortunately, has really, it's been a baby boomer outlet its entire existence, you know? Ba yeah. Boomers are its primary demo, has have been its primary demo across its 45 years of being a thing, right? And boomers are a great demo to have. There's a lot of them. They have a shit ton of money. Um, but they're, you know, at some point they're going to die. And at that point, I think public radio will die, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just it's just inevitable, right? So the question for like YouTube is like, are they going to be able to keep bringing in new people and thus refreshing the platform? Or is the platform going to age? Um, and you know like and, and, you know and, and it, every you know you know facebook is asking the same question right you know um certainly we know that facebook users are old um is that the is that because those are the people who use facebook and when they die facebook will die or is facebook the kind of thing that people will age into you know, mm -hmm. and I think so far the evidence has really shown that it's more the latter, that when people get to be a certain age and they need to use Facebook more for kind of keeping touch with family that spreads all over the country as people grow up and leave the house and get careers and move and blah, blah, blah. And then also they need to use social media for professional purposes for using groups and things like that, that people are kind of aging into Facebook, you know? Yeah. And the question is, is like, yeah, will, will that kind of happen with YouTube or will basically like the generation that's on TikTok right now, like they'll stay on TikTok their entire life and then TikTok will age, you know, and mm -hmm. there'll be like, you know, people in the old folks home being like, you know, we want to get TikTok on the brain beam <laughs> machine. We want to watch Joshua, you know, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, will that happen? I think some version of that probably will, you know, to some extent. Right. Yeah. Um, to a certain, I mean, I don't really care, right? Because it's like I have an audience and I have a platform and I think both will age with me. So, you know, I think I'll be fine. If I can keep this going, I'll be able to actually retire and <laughs> and <laughs> done, you know? Um, and, you know, the next generation of content creators can work on the brain bean machine or whatever the next platform is, you know? Mm -hmm. But for YouTube, that's like, that's something that they have to be thinking about. Or not, yeah. I don't know, they can they'll have all the money in the world by then, you know, uh, and they can just go, go colonize Mars or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah. So you definitely touched on the word trust, which is awesome because I think, uh, being a YouTuber and having your fans, there's this level of trust, um, there. And I think you really respect that. It's incredible to see. Um, how do you, like, what's your feelings towards your fans? Do you feel that you owe them something to get out more content or just what is that kind of relationship dynamic between you and them? Sure. Um, I, I think you, I think you, I think you definitely owe it to your audience to communicate with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you expect them to be f there for you when you put out a release, like you're, you're, you're banking on having, you know, that core crew, like I've got a core crew of like, you know, 200,000 or so viewers who are there for almost every vid and will watch it in the first week. Right. And I rely on them. And if I do a pizza video, then I get a million views in a week, right? And there's all kinds of people who are kind of on the periphery who maybe they're subscribed, but they don't watch everything, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. they'll come for certain things, right? But I've got my core of like 200K around the world who show up for almost everything. And because I rely for them to be there when I want them to be there, I think that I owe it to them to communicate to them about when I'm going to have content. So that means either implicitly communicating with them by simply being there on my regular release schedule, 2 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, GMT minus four, um, every Monday and Thursday, right? Or when I'm going to violate that for whatever reason to let them know, okay? So I think that's the chief thing that you owe them is to communicate with them. I think that you owe it to them to respect their intelligence and their time, right? That was sort of my hook. That was what got me to blow up was, I mean, that Reddit post that kind of, that, that drove so much of my early audience growth 
the headline on it was, oh my God, a YouTube cook who gets straight to the point, right? Mm -hmm. And that was my journalism background, right? Because, you know, we, that's the thing that like we learned about in journalism a hundred years ago and that YouTubers are only just now figuring out, you know, the inverted pyramid, say the single most important thing you have to say at the very beginning, and then say the second most important thing you have to say, and then the third most important thing you have to say, so that people, people can jump off the train at any given time. Newspapering figured that out literally a hundred years ago, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and uh, and YouTubers are still even really popular ones are like being like, hey y'all, I'm back for another one. What's good? Uh, don't forget to smash that like and subscribe button. And uh, you know, so and so was saying, hey, you know, I should really do a video about this. And I thought, wow, yeah, that really. I've been wanting to do that vid for a while, All right? So y'all, okay, today's the day we're finally going to do the video about X role theme song yeah and then they come back and they say okay so let's talk about x and it's like no just start there start with x just go there <laughs> right? and good god enough with the theme songs man right like you know which is so ironic because it's like i started off life as a composer and like the reason i I got into doing, you know, other kinds of media was like, I thought, oh, well, I can't make a living as a composer. Maybe if I start working in news, I can like write theme songs, you know, for shows or something like yeah. that. And then now it's ironic that one of the things everyone likes about my channel is that it doesn't have a theme song. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, respect their time and respect their intelligence. You certainly owe that to them. Some things I think I don't owe my audience, right? Like I don't owe my audience to um, listen to all of their feedback, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember somebody commented, they were like, on one of the science -y videos, they were like, hey, you should really like do a poll of your audience to see how many of them are into these science -y videos because I know I just skip them. And I was like, dude, I can see exactly how many people watched everything and for how long they watched it. Why would I do a poll? Like I, you know, <laughs> yeah. Why would I go for an? Why would I do a qualitative study when I have a quantitative study right in front of me all the time? You know, um, I don't need to do statistical sampling when I know the entire. I've got a census. You know, I a head count of every single viewer. Right. So you mm. don't owe it to them to listen to all of their feedback. Right. Um, People don't, you know, and this is something that like, you know, Steve Jobs was so brilliant about articulating, which was that people, consumers don't actually know what they want to a great extent, you know, it's, and that's not because they're dumb, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's not because it's, it's because they have other things to worry about. They have their life to worry about. They've got their job and their kids. Okay. It's your job to figure out what they want, what they need, what's useful to them. Okay. And listening to them speak is what, you know, a thing to do, but that should not be the deciding factor. They don't know what they want. It's your job mm -hmm. to figure that out. Right. So I try to listen to my inner Steve, you know, um, a lot. And I think, well, you know, they might say they don't like this kind of video, but empirically, what seems to be, what do they seem to be watching? Um, so I really try to be very analytically driven in that sense. I also try to be mission driven, right? So while a lot of people might just want a bunch of food porn from me, you know, and I could probably get more views if I just did super sexy or gimmicky um, recipes, mm -hmm. I'm mission driven. I'm trying to give people recipes that will actually help them in their lives. I'm trying to put out informational content that will make people smarter and savvier consumers and all that kind of stuff, right? So to a certain extent, I do vids sometimes that I know are going to tank, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I just did this video about how to grow tomatoes at home. And that's mm -hmm. like my worst performing video in many, many, many months. And I knew it would be, and I don't care because I want to spread the gospel of growing your own food. Um, you know, should something happen that disrupts the global supply chain, um, <laughs> you know, people need to know how to grow food, you know, yeah, it's, it's true. really it's fun and it connects you with your humanity and you, you, the, and the earth in ways that I think are beneficial to all of us. And I want to spread the gospel of gardening. 
for mission reasons, not for business reasons, right? So a lot of my content is really mission driven and I know it's not gonna necessarily do great for views, but I try to proceed from that thing. And so I don't owe it to my audience to simply give them whatever slop I know they'll lick up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, instead, I think I owe it to my audience to try to listen to the angels on my shoulders that are saying, don't just go for the views, don't just go for the clicks, go for what will make the world a better place long-term. Even if the, that sounds very grandiose for a cooking channel, I think it's true, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, and lastly, I you know I certainly, and this is maybe a little bit controversial. I I don't. I think I owe it to my audience to not um, do sponsorships for products that are scams, right? Yeah. You know. <laughs> But I don't think I owe it to my audience to only to restrict myself to deals for products that I really believe are the best in the marketplace or things that I would buy or something like that. You know, at the end of the day, it's still a commercial, right? right. And its primary function is to pay for the content so that you don't have to, right? Um, and I think that people can understand that it's a commercial and that um you know and that it, and then a commercial is that's what makes it different from the rest of the content you know mm -hmm. um so while i absolutely you know colin and i will never and we've turned away tons of deals from companies that we were like oh this is a scam or <laughs> you know or god this is just this is just a terrible product you know <laughs> we've had ones that you know we got the product and i tried it and i was like come this sucks this thing sucks i cannot in good conscience ask people to buy this right mm -hmm. um and we'll and it will be like okay well let's let's just spike the deal you know we, we've done that a bunch you know <clears throat> or you know like i for example i've gotten offers from like super violent video games that like i don't you know that's not a, especially with like two young boys and i see what violent content does to them and their behavior like i totally believe all of the all of the quantitative research that shows that that stuff really does have a negative in fact <laughs> impact on behavior and psychology and all that kind of stuff <coughs> so i've turned away some of those you know but at the same time though it's also not the case that like every single product i feature is something that i really believe is the best of its kind in the marketplace um you know also like what you know why do you, why does my opinion matter that much like just because it's not super useful to me doesn't mean it's not going to be super useful to you you know um so i don't think i owe it to my my viewers to like vet my sponsors as thoroughly as some would ask you know mm -hmm. or another i mean other ones were like you know sometimes people get mad about um sponsors that are fundamentally um data mining sponsors right like you know free free products that are ultimately about kind of you know sucking up consumer data and people get mad at me that i'm you know doing that and i just well, that's 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 a bad example of what I'm talking about because I just think they're wrong. I think those products are awesome. I think those services are awesome. What the hell do you have to hide about what you're shopping for, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to the store and buying ingredients to build a bomb, then maybe don't use the product, or maybe don't build the bomb <laughs> is the better thing, right? But like, you yeah. know, you know, these companies, you know, they don't they they aggregate the data. Your identity is not attached to it. Who cares, you know? Yeah. And ultimately. And I have found this as I have like gotten older and become like, and, and gotten money <laughs> as a result of all of this. And like, I'm more of a, you know, I, I really appreciate now that like advertising algorithms are serving me with products that I actually want, <laughs> you know, I have yeah. found so many cool pieces of camera gear through like you know ads that algorithms are serving me because they know what i need they know what i'm searching for and like i'm busy i don't have time to like go and seek out products and i'm like oh that tilt head that's exactly what i need right now mm -hmm. thank you algorithm for serving me that ad i'm super happy that they have like have all this data about me that they could give me that ad because i bought that product and it was perfect for me like i think a lot of the suspicion about <coughs> <laughs> cookies and all that other kind of stuff like is so irrational right like um you know they're not it's it's a good thing to be served with relevant ads that's good <laughs> um you know i i'm i'm <coughs> you know i'm a, i'm a lefty in a lot of ways like i really you know i want 
I would like to see a much stronger social safety net in the United States. I think the current crisis we're living through shows the utter folly of the American healthcare system and how we need to get with the rest of the world and have true universal publicly funded healthcare yesterday, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm also fundamentally a capitalist. You know, I believe that capitalism has the best track record at providing the most material abundance to the most people of any system in modern history, right? Like mm. I believe in it. I think that it works. And I think that like targeted advertising is a really good example of how it can work of not, you know, of a serving you with ads that are relevant to you and helping you to find products that will actually help you in your life and B taking inefficiencies out of the market, not wasting money on broadcast ads that are basically, you know, you're throwing away money, putting ads in front of eyeballs for people who are never going to buy that product, right? All mm -hmm. of that is just money that's bleeding out of the system that could instead be going into things that you want, like quality content creation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, targeted advertising keeps more money in the system going toward making the things that you want, is my message to people. Yeah, uh, and so, I think so, some, sometimes okay. sometimes capitalism works, y'all. Sometimes it doesn't, yeah. and there's ways that government needs to like he, you know, <laughs> there's government needs to do things to mitigate against all the bad things in capitalism, right? But yeah. like, there's a reason that like you know, Israel and Northern and Western Europe, like <laughs> these that these societies are so functional in lots of ways. Well, maybe Israel's not such a great example given all of its particular problems, but, um, you know, but I mean, it's just like high, you know, highly developed economies with really, really strong social safety nets. That's the way to go. That's the system that works yeah. manifestly. That's the system that works. There's no freaking mystery. Okay. Social democracy. It works y'all. Let's just do it. <laughs> Let capitalism yeah. do the thing that capitalism does well and let government do the things that it does well. It's a great compromise. It's a match made in heaven. As mm -hmm. I would say on my channel, it's a perfect binary system. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I think it's that I'm hoping that people listening to this are going to really understand then where it comes from and why you're bringing that into your channels. And I just one last question um, before we go. Um, you know, even though this might be the kind of antithesis of who you are, because you did say, you know, you're very pro the uh, heads up cooking and heads down cooking. Do you see yourself at some point kind of writing a cookbook, something along those lines, kind of moving forward, or you're really just content uh, with the channel? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, it's been funny for people like, you know, people be like, hey, so when are you gonna when are you go on the Food Network or something like that? I'm like, <laughs> why? How? Nothing like literally nothing is better than what I have, right? Like, you know, my my profit margin is so astronomical, you know, I mean, yeah. it's like how, what and I'm and my level of fame is so perfect, right? Like I have enough of an audience to provide me with a very comfortable living and to make me feel as though I'm making a difference in the world and make me feel heard and all of those kinds of things. But at the same time, like I don't get like recognized on the street. I don't mm -hmm. have to like put on I don't have to be like Michael Jackson and put on like Groucho glasses before I go to the mall, you know, like it's the, it's the awesomest level of fame. It's great. You know? Yeah. Um, so in, in a way it's like, this is perfect. Why would I want to do anything else? Right. On the other hand, it's like, I think you should always be open to new things and growth and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, like I do, I have a, I have a, you know, a development deal, a TV development deal, you know, which 95% of people on YouTube have a TV development deal. And, you know, and 95% of those deals will come to absolutely nothing. And I don't expect <laughs> mine to come to very much at all, you know, but there's a, you know, there's a very talented young man and at a, at a firm somewhere who's working on some, you know, some, some pilot ideas and may, maybe something will come out of it. Who knows? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I've been approached by some people in traditional publishing about cookbooks. All of those conversations have left me feeling like that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, you're pitching me and this sounds awful. Imagine what it, this conversation would be like when you're no longer pitching me and we're just talking about the realities. Like, right. it's a terrible business, you know? And I say, you know, my wife is a, is a, is a published author with, you know, six, six books on major publishing houses, you know? And I see what she goes through, you know, it's like, you know, on the one hand, we're, we're thrilled that we have her, her we, we're thrilled with her deals and we're thrilled with her publishers. On the other hand, it's like, that's, that's a tough, it's tough to make a living, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, 
you know, maybe one of those deals will come by that kind of looks like a smart thing to do, but so far none of them have. And I'm really leaning more towards doing something self-published in that world, right? So, you know, part of it is just that because, you know, one of the things that traditional publishers will say whenever they do a, a deal with a YouTuber is they'll say um, that only about like 10% of the content in the book can be previously published stuff. And I don't know, on the one hand, I want to be like, okay, they know more about publishing than I do, and I should respect their expertise. On the other hand, I'm pretty sure that's bad business, <laughs> right? Like, because if I was going to buy a cookbook from a YouTuber, I would want all of the, the hits to be in there, right? Yeah. Because I would want to use it as, I would A, either want to use it as a resource so that I don't have to like go into my phone in order to look up everything. I'd want to have like some really beautiful, glossy, object in my kitchen that I could reference physically more easily as I'm cooking, right? Or I would be buying it as a gift and I would want to give people not a bunch of recipes that I've never seen and don't know if they're good, but I want to say to my mom, hey, here's this guy, this guy on YouTube, that his lasagna recipe that I was telling you about. I know you're never going to look at it on the internet, so here it is in a book. You know, check it out. Merry Christmas, mom. You know, mm -hmm. right? Like, I just think the be the smarter business deal is to have a book that actually is all of your greatest hits from YouTube. You know, so and they don't want to do that, and I just I think they're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Might you know? Um, so you know, one of, like like Lauren, my wife, has a a brilliant idea that I I think we might try to do at some point is to do like a not a cookbook, but actually. Um, I don't know if you know you, you grew up with one of these from your grandma or something, but one of those like kind of wooden recipe boxes with recipes on index cards. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, yes, I, awesome yeah, like remember. retro thing. Like, yeah. could we could we basically like print up one of those? Um, could we mass produce one of those? You mm -hmm. know, where like I could like you know I could handwrite every single recipe with a bunch of like cool little marginalia and illustrations and things like that, and then get that printed on like glossy index cards. Mm -hmm. And then put that into like some super 70s retro looking, you know, wooden card box. And that's my cookbook, you know, that I sell. Like, I think that's an awesome idea. And, you know, maybe we'd lose money on it or maybe we'd make a time. I have no idea. But, you know, I, I think that's a something, something we'll try at some point. And if there's like some kind of traditional publisher or merch maker who wants to work with me on that deal and mitigate some of my risk on that deal, like, that'd be great. You know, I'd be happy to t talk with you about that. But I don't want to... I don't want to do deals with people who I think have bad ideas. And I think that like, there's a reason why traditional publishing is in such dire straits. Like I think a lot of their ideas are bad and mm -hmm. I don't just even, you know, even though I don't have a business degree or anything, I just, I feel empowered to follow my instincts, you know, cause I just, you know, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure they don't either. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I really want to say thank you so much uh, for taking out time today and everything uh, you've been saying is just super refreshing and a really just an awesome take on, you know, who you are and what it all takes to become, you know, a YouTube uh, star. And again, thank you so much. And you know what, if you make that um, cook, sorry, the, uh, with the cards coming out, I, yeah, am yeah. Def I am definitely getting one for my mom and myself. And uh, again, thank you so much. And this has been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. This bye -bye. is the Thought Leaders Podcast.